Well, do turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And um, I want you to uh, imagine that you have a neighbor called Billy. He's a very sociable, non-Christian, and uh, the highlight of his week is his Friday night uh, out after work when he meets up with friends at a local pub and catches up on the gossip over a few drinks, after which they um, invariably all go on to a nightclub where Billy enjoys drinking and dancing the night away. And, and sometimes, when he's particularly drunk, the night doesn't end there, but he ends up going home with one of his female friends. But one day, Billy becomes a Christian, and it's clear that he's got a great spiritual appetite to learn about the things of God. For a time, his uh, Friday nights out are forgotten, but sometime later, he realizes he misses his old friends. And so he starts to return to his Friday night pattern of pubbing and clubbing. He's a little bit uncomfortable with the clash of cultures between Christianity and his old friends. But he knows enough about the Bible to realize that uh, as a Christian, he is free to drink and to dance. And so he's, he's not sinning simply by going along. Having said that, he soon discovers that it's difficult just to go along for him because the temptation to be sucked back into drunkenness is strong. Past patterns of behavior are difficult to break for him. And so he decides to encourage some of his Christian friends to join him as he reasons that they can help one another keep pure. He also keeps his uh, church commitments as a top priority, for as he reassures himself, regular attendance at church and increased knowledge of the Bible will surely keep him close to God. Question is, is he right? Can he do this? Or are there dangers in what he's doing? Well, that's where the Apostle Paul helps us because 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is dealing with a very similar situation. Actually, uh, chapters 8 to 10 are of a piece. And uh, you might remember from a few weeks ago that the presenting issue in this whole section concerns food sacrificed to idols. Now, as Ben said, this uh, initially sounds like a, a rather quirky topic, but actually it was a highly relevant one for them back then. Because Corinth was a, a very religious or superstitious city, and therefore almost every event or activity involves some sort of tribute to pagan gods. Ben highlighted how this was true of meat bought in the market. But it was also true of many restaurants in the city, which were often attached to temples, a bit like Hudson's being attached to Danbury Mission. Except unlike Hudson's, the local priest would stand outside his temple and sacrifice some animals in honor of his god, after which the meat from these animals would be turned into some delicious dish, which would be eaten in the attached dining room or restaurant. You can't really imagine me with a pig outside the front, you know, sort of slaughtering it and then giving it for the ham sandwiches when you go in to Hudson's. That's the sort of thing that was happening. Now, these uh, temple feasts were extraordinarily popular at the time. In fact, almost everybody, apart from the Jews, would have attended them because they were regarded as a, a great social night out. What's more, not only uh, did people chat over good food at these feasts, but they also uh, found employment or carried out business transactions. It was really sort of the whole of civic life was held in these places. And for those who stayed on to the very end of the evening, well, it could often end up like a modern night out clubbing. Drunkenness and sex was rife. In fact, many of the pagan temples provided prostitutes in order to satisfy their customers. 
However, whether or not people joined in with everything that went on, I hope you can see why these evenings were part and parcel of life for many. And so suddenly to stop going along would have been a big challenge for them. And that's why it seems that once Paul had left Corinth, some of the Christians had begun to drift back to these temple dinners. Now, like Billy in my opening story, they probably felt a little uncomfortable with everything that went on, but they, they reasoned there was nothing inherently wrong with just attending and enjoying the meal. It also seems that, um, rather like Billy, they were trying to persuade other Christians to join them. And finally, I, I suspect, again like Billy, they reassured themselves that whatever happened on these evenings, as long as they kept up their commitment at church, well, then they would be spiritually secure. And that means that at the end of uh, chapter 9 that we got to last week, when Paul talked about being disqualified from the prize of eternal life, I imagine the, Christi uh, the Corinthian Christians thought, this doesn't apply to us. After all, they probably thought, we've been baptized uh, we regularly eat and drink at the Lord's Supper, and therefore, we must be okay with God. We won't be disqualified. To which Paul responds, and our first point, be warned, you might fall. Be warned, you might fall. And he starts his warning by taking his readers back to another group of people who thought of themselves as spiritually okay with God. He takes them back to the generation of Israelites that came out of Egypt with Moses at the time of the Exodus. And in chapter 10, verse 1, he, reads, uh, he writes, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Paul is telling the Corinthians here that in many ways they were very similar to those early Israelites. For example, when those Israelites went through the Red Sea, the Israelites underwent a sort of baptism-type experience. And when they ate manna and drank water from the rock, well, they enjoyed a sort of Lord's Supper. And so just like the Corinthians, the Israelites looked spiritually secure. Nevertheless, says Paul in verse 5, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Why was God so displeased with them? Well, because although they'd experienced his goodness, although they said they believed in the Lord, the Israelites still gave their heart to evil things. In, in, uh, in verses 7 to 10, Paul gives us actually four examples of this. In verse 7, he refers to Exodus 32 and points out that the Israelites were idolaters who indulged in pagan revelry. In verse 8, he refers to Numbers 25 and their sexual immorality. In verse 9, he refers to Numbers 21 and Israel's testing of the Lord. And then in verse 10, he refers to Numbers 14 and Israel's grumbling. And in short, on each of these occasions, the Israelites ended up putting other things in front of God. Things like revelry and sex and their own comfort and enjoyment. And the result was they faced God's anger and punishment. And so Paul is saying, if that can happen to them, it can happen to you. So verse 11, be warned. Learn the history lesson. Watch out for temptations, otherwise you too might fall. Look with me at verse 12, which is really the summary of his teaching to this point. Verse 12. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. We need to hear this warning too. See, this isn't just a message for the Corinthians, nor is it a message for that person who sat next to you at the moment. 
Now, this is a message for you and for me as well. Because none of us can be complacent about our spiritual security. We might be baptized. We might be signed up partners of this church. We might regularly take communion. But that doesn't mean we can't fall. And so we need to stand firm and not play with temptation. For the Corinthians, temptation arose from those ungodly activities that surrounded the pagan temple feasts. For us, well, temptations will arise from other sources, from nights out, from sex, from drink, from money, and so on. And let me be clear, whilst none of these things are inherently sinful, and they're not, there's nothing wrong with going out and dancing and drinking, nonetheless, if they cause us to stumble, if we are tempted to put them in front of God, to idolize them or to abuse them, then we must be careful that those things don't bring us down. And so in Billy's case, well, he must ask himself honestly whether his Friday nights are in danger of doing that to him. And this is really important because uh, whilst we all stumble occasionally, we are all sinners. If a particular sin gains a, a settled foothold in our lives, and if a, a permanent gap opens up between what we say and what we do, then we're in trouble. And we have to wonder whether our faith is genuine. Which leads us on to our second point, which is be sensible and flee danger. Now, having uh, heard Paul's warning in verses 1 to 12, it, it's possible that some of the Corinthians might have responded to Paul by saying something like this, but Paul, Paul, you don't know how hard it is for us here. If we stopped going to those feasts, we, we'd, we'd drop out of our social circle. We'd be lepers, and we'd miss out on business opportunities, and our family would suffer. These feasts are important. We just have to go. But, but Paul, don't worry. We, we also know that God is good. And so he'll understand. He'll, he'll understand if sometimes we have to end up compromising a little during the evening. Our case is a special case. Well, Paul anticipates such thinking, and so he writes verse 13 of chapter 10. No temptation. Chapter 10, maybe it's not chapter 10. Uh, verse 13. Uh, yes, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he'll also provide a way out for you so that you can endure it. His point here is that um, actually the Corinthians have no excuse for giving in to their temptation because it's not unique. Their case is no different from anybody else's. And what's more, God is faithful. And so he'll help them when they're facing temptations. In particular, he will always provide a way out of a potentially compromising situation. And so as Paul says in verses 14 and 15, if they're sensible people, by which he means if they're rational people, then they'll look for God's escape route in the situation and flee the danger. And you know the same is true for us. There are no such things as special cases However badly we feel our particular temptations, they are not unique. And therefore, we don't have excuses for giving in to them. What's more, there's, there's no such thing as acceptable sins. You know, those things that we do time and again, those things that we, we know are wrong, but we persuade ourselves that they're not that bad, 
and that God will understand. No, he doesn't understand. Because, you see, he wants us to depend on his strength to resist temptation and to seek his wisdom to discern ways out of the dangerous situations we find ourselves in. Uh, and then we, when we see the way out, well, we should flee. We should run like mad away from sin. And we should also take steps to make sure we don't walk back into that temptation again. Um, some years ago, I was talking to a group of university students who were struggling with looking at um, unhelpful images on their electronic devices. A couple of them gave the impression that they were facing an impossible temptation in this area and that there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. But that wasn't true. Because in this verse, God promises that he always provides an escape route. Uh, the question is whether we want to see it and whether we want to make the most of it. Uh, often, God's provision will take the form of another person, a, a friend who can hold us accountable in the area that we're struggling with. But God will also call to mind other ways in which we can help ourselves to flee danger. I was encouraged that um, some of the students recognized that, and they placed safeguards to prevent them from falling in that area. Some of them have put super strong filters on their phones. And some even allowed their friends to look at their browsing history so others would see what they'd been looking at. These were ideas that God had called to mind and which they, in God's strength, were putting into practice. However, the question we've got to ask ourselves is whether we really want to prevent ourselves from falling. Each of us will be vulnerable to temptation in different areas. For example, some, like Billy, will find clubbing difficult. But for others, they'll, they'll be able to go to a nightclub and dance, and there'll be no problem whatsoever. But be assured there will be something completely different that will be a potential stumbling block for them. So there can be no definitive rules here, no list, list of do's and don'ts to follow. We are all different. But whatever that place or person that tempts us to sin, the one thing I do know is that we'll be reluctant to let it go. You see, we, we all grow comfortable with our sins. We end up needing them. And therefore, we, we tend to get upset if someone suggests that we give up clubbing or drinking or that boyfriend or that girlfriend but of course, the upset should ring alarm bells that we've got a problem. That's why we're getting so worked up about it. And so we should plead with God to give us strength, to give up our idol, to stop playing with temptation and to flee the danger. And so if I was speaking to Billy, I'd ask him, whether he was playing with temptation on those Friday nights out. And if he was, well, I'd encourage him to flee before he got too comfortable with it. Having said that, our, our sermon so far has been based on the fact that there is nothing inherently wrong with going out for a meal and a, a drink and a dance. And that's what the Corinthians also believed about their pagan feasts, that there was nothing inherently wrong with them attending them, was there? But in verses 16 to 22, Paul actually challenges that. For, for whilst he confirms that um, the pagan gods don't exist, so they, so they don't represent a threat to Christians, he points out that demons do exist. And the reality was that a demonic influence lay behind the religious proceedings at those pagan temples. And obviously Christ and the demonic are incompatible. And therefore, he says, verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. 
You cannot have both a, a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. You see, someone who is or has communion with the Lord cannot under any circumstances also have communion with demons. And yet, by joining with the pagans at their temple priests, that's exactly what they were doing, whether they realized it or not. And so Paul, in verse 22, challenges them by asking, are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? And are we stronger than him? Which, of course, the answer is always going to be, no, of course we're not stronger than God, and therefore we won't get away with it. Well, we also need to grasp that there are things that are just no-goes with God. Sitting at the Lord's table doesn't give us license to do whatever we like. Quite the reverse. As followers of Jesus, we should shun anything that is opposed to him, especially if it has a demonic or a cult influence. And so whilst going to the local pub might be fine... Going to one of its psychic, psychic evenings is not appropriate, even if we don't join in. And sadly, it seems that the uh, round of psychic evenings in the local pubs is just beginning again. And attending our neighbor's Ouija party, Ouija board party, that's out too. In fact, even reading our horoscopes must be handled with care. For, for we live in a society that often trivializes the devil, don't we? But the Bible says we shouldn't. We should never play with the demonic world. Be warned. Don't fall. Be sensible. Flee danger. And then finally, and more briefly, be Christ-like. Seek the good of others. And that is the focus of uh, verses 23, chapter 10, verse 23, to 11, verse 1. And here, Paul is applying the principle that he's already outlined in chapters 8 and 9. We've looked at that in the last couple of weeks. He's applying it now to the situation of meat eaten in people's homes. You see, um, any of the sacrificed meat not eaten at the pagan feasts would be delivered to the market and subsequently sold and eaten in people's homes. And the question was, should Christians eat that meat? Verse 25. What if it was served at a dinner party hosted by a non-Christian? Verse 27. Should we make a fuss about it? Well, Paul agreed with the Corinthians that there is no theological problem whatsoever with eating that meat. It was permissible, unlike joining in with pagan worship. But Paul's primary concern is that whatever they decide to do, they should try not to cause others to stumble. And Paul summarizes his, this teaching in 10 verse 31, when he says, so, whatever, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ. So back to Billy. It means that when it comes to Friday evenings, he doesn't make his decision primarily based on his own preferences. Rather, he asks himself first, what does God want me to do? And then secondly, how can I best serve others and seek their good, especially their spiritual good? 
You know, um, as we've studied this section of 1 Corinthians over the last three weeks, I've been reminded, I think, of the radical difference that exists between Christ's priorities and my natural priorities. For when it, makes, when it comes to making a, a choice concerning things in life, Choices where we have freedom, where there's not a simple right or wrong, when I instinctively think about what's right for me first. I've got freedom, so I can think about what I want to do. But God, if he gets a look in, and others definitely come down the agenda. But in these chapters, we've been challenged to put God first. And then others, and us last. That is a profoundly other person centered view of freedom, isn't it? And one that goes against the grain, but it is what Christ did when he gave up his freedom and rights to come to earth. He sacrificed his life in order to please his Father and seek our good. And I, for one, am really grateful that he did. And so I pray that I'll get better at following his example. For he has proved that it is the right and the best way to live. And with that in mind, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are sorry that so often we end up living for ourselves, thinking primarily about ourselves and that uh, God and others sort of trail behind. We're sorry, Heavenly Father, for, the, for those times when um, that attitude has led us into temptation and when we've given in to that temptation. And so we thank you so much that forgiveness is available in Jesus. Whatever we have done in the past, that can be forgiven. But we know, Heavenly Father, that our forgiveness is possible because Jesus gave up his freedoms to please his Father, seek our good, and sacrifice himself. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we might remember that gospel truth in the coming days. And that might inspire us not to make the same mistakes as we've made in the past. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be alert, to watch out so that we don't fall. Help us, Heavenly Father, to see the escape routes you provide us with and to take them. And help us, Heavenly Father, not to drag others down with us, but to seek their good. And we pray all of this, knowing that it's only possible because you've given us your spirit who can help us change. And so we pray that we might make the most of your spirit. And we pray this for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.